First question, just to get the ball rolling. <laughs> Bethany loves these. All right, I'm gonna try to do it as good as Bethany does. I'm a six month golden. I'm good when told to sit or down or wait, but I get so excited when someone wants to get, wants to pet me. Can you help me with my impulse control? I most certainly can. So that one's a bit of a challenge because Bethany might uh, say something a little bit different, but in the beginning, I usually have mom tell me what people can and cannot pet me. So if I'm already excited too, and I'm, yes, I'm coming from the angle of the dog, work with me guys, Bethany's better at this. When people want to pet me, I look to my mom and dad to give me a command to tell me to sit, and if I can be calm, then mom and dad will allow people to pet me. The easiest way to do that is for people to be given a treat and then to ask your puppy to sit. So already they now have a work drive. They have like this work relationship that they're building with your puppy. I, I couldn't do it, I couldn't stay in character. So now you're, these people have a work relationship with your puppy. The minute they have food, the minute they ask something of your puppy, they will be more likely to work with them rather than want to jump on them. Of course, after you get a good command, you give that treat, maybe then you can give a little bit of love, but all of it really comes down to how is your puppy acting? If puppy's trying to jump the whole time, then I usually will say, all right guys, it's a little too much energy. I don't think we can do a greeting at this time. And as you get your puppy more trained, more impulse control sets in, then you can allow your puppy to say hi to them. So start slow. If your puppy just can't contain themselves, don't do a greeting because all it does is it promotes bad behavior of jumping. It doesn't promote the good behavior of, hey, calm puppy means calm pets. So that's usually how I play that one out. See what your puppy does, high energy, no petting, work them through the situation, and if you need to, bubble out, which means that here's my people, I'll go around them, give them a wide berth, use some food to draw my puppy on, good puppy treat, and then keep on going. And I didn't have a name here, otherwise I would've used it. Sorry guys. Well, we have a TikTok question that keeps popping up, so it seems like they really need some help. Let me have it. So the question is, my dog does not stop barking at people, cars, passing, other animals. What do I do? That sounds to me like you might need a training tool. And there's a couple different ones. What I need with the training tool, it gives you additional leverage. So what does leverage mean? Leverage means having control of a situation that was previously uncontrollable. So that might mean just having more leverage over where the head looks, being able to put a little bit of tension on the leash, move in the opposite direction. And when your dog works under threshold, threshold is basically where your dog can't focus on you. And then below threshold is where they can focus on you. Getting them under threshold might mean getting them 10 to 20 feet away from that distraction, dogs, cars, people, whatever it is. And when you get some focus, then redirect with the food and maybe ask for a couple commands. I, I look at it as like tuning in your puppy or tuning in your dog. I didn't get an age, did we? No. Age definitely applies guys, because if I have a young six to, or I guess, let's say six month to eight month old puppy, I might be able to be a little bit more demanding of them. But if I have a 16 week to 20 feet, 24 week puppy, then I'm gonna use more food guidance. I'm gonna be more avoidance based, so I'm not gonna get as close to these big distractions that I know are distractions. I'll try to work them under threshold and never even hit threshold. And if we have a full blown adult dog, you can be a little bit more, no, not even a little bit, you can be way more demanding. Hey, pup or dog, let's go, let's get out of here. A little bit of leash pressure, you get them under threshold, then you can start working them and start helping them out. But there's a lot of great trainers out there that'll help you guys introduce a training tool. I personally would never recommend introducing a training tool unless you have the professional help of an experienced dog trainer used to using those tools. Because I mean, there's a lot that goes into it. We don't want just people grabbing training tools and then popping dogs. We wanna make sure that they get introduced the proper way and they understand exactly what we're looking for. Hopefully I answered your question. If I get an age, I might be able to do a little bit more. They're following up. They say, we use the command leave it, but he's not seeming to understand it. So leave it only has value if you've been able to teach leave it to have value. So I could tell my dog pineapple a million times, but she'll never know what pineapple means. But if I say pineapple, I pull my dog away from the distraction. I move far enough away to where she starts focusing on me. That became my leave it command. Leave it is whatever you associate to leave it. I think an easier command for leave it is a firm no but make sure that you always act upon that no. I can't just say no and then expect my dog to be like, oh, mom, dad, they don't like it when I bark at that car. 
I gotta say no, hey, let's go. I get them out of there. I redirect them away from it. And when I start getting focus, then I start giving commands and redirecting them to good things instead of defaulting to the bad. Every time you give a no, you can't leave it at a no. Think of no as like teaching a little kid right from wrong. We don't steal the piece of candy because they gave you a dollar to go buy the piece of candy. We don't bark at the cars because instead you do come, heal, sit, and down and focus on me instead. So you gotta give meaning to a command, whether it's leave it, no, drop it, whatever command it is, it needs to mean something to your pup and that only comes from training the command to mean something. Hopefully I answered it. That was a good one, that was actually a really good one. All right, next one. We have Reshma, one-year-old lab, chews our hands. He sometimes jumps and bites on us ferociously. Parentheses, playfully. Probably just a lot of growling, that type, that type of thing. How to calm him. Okay, so I think maybe this is even a little bit more relationship. A lot of times when dogs are ferociously, happily, going for the hands, it's because we've conditioned the hands to be play toys. So I, uh, I tend to get a lot of women saying that the puppies will bite their hands, but then their husbands or their significant others are playing with their hands. Puppies do not generalize. And one-year-old lap, so you're kind of out of puppy territory, so that might, even, that might even be more testing behavior. But what I get from there is that means that the dog is saying that I'm allowed to do it. So if you want to pull back on that, one, they drag around a leash on a flat collar or a harness, supervised at all times because we don't want them to get it tangled up on something. And either we eliminate all hand play because dogs don't generalize. If one person does it, the dog does it with everybody. Until they get much older, they don't really have that understanding yet. And yes, one-year-old dog isn't a puppy anymore, but it's still an adolescent dog. And I think it was a male too. I don't know, male now, it doesn't really matter. It's an adolescent dog, so he's testing boundaries. So leash, dog starts going for the hand, stand up, make yourself big, hey, hey, hey! Back them up, hands up like a tree, stand still, wait for them to back off, sit down, whatever it is, and if they don't, use that leash and kind of Exert some control with the leash. That might mean picking up leash, stepping in, hey, hey, and then using that arm to kind of extend them away from you. We call that spatial pressure. When you move into a dog with firmness, the goal is that they understand that they're doing something incorrect and they back off a little bit. It's not a mean thing. It's not like you're like, hey, bad dog, no. They don't get that, guys. Dogs live in the world of energy. The more energy you put in, the more response you get. Neutral energy gets the best response. Angry energy gets dogs that might test you and match your energy, or they may just get confused. Most time, if I see playfully biting, they're not doing it to be malicious, they're doing it because they think you enjoy it. So you gotta switch it up on them. You have to help them understand that we don't enjoy hand play. So let me give you my three strike rule, and then I'll, I'll move on from this one. Strike one, firm no, grab a toy, and redirect. So no, toy, good, play some tug. Get them focusing on the toy, get them playing with the toy. After a couple seconds, maybe I kind of like let it go, see if they self-play, stand up, wait them out. I'm not gonna start walking away yet. Just kind of hanging out, maybe hands even a little bit higher, stand like a tree. Dog calms down, dog, dog redirects to the toy, I move away. Strike two, that's when I'm gonna be a little bit more firm. This dog is still going for my hands, that's when I do my no, I step in, use the leash if you need it. I don't use it right away. I try to step and use body language first. I may not always be holding the leash. That doesn't work. Dog is still persistent. Maybe the dog has too much energy. Maybe I gotta say to myself, I can't help you right now. I don't know what it is that's going on in your head, but we're not playing this game. So I take a deep breath. I go from my ah to neutral. No emotion. I calmly grab my dog's leash, guide them to their crate, playpen, whatever area that's their own put them in the crate, close it, lock it. I know a lot of you guys are probably saying to yourself, but Sparky, I thought crate was never a punishment. And you're absolutely right, it's not. When you think of crate, you gotta think of area that's their own. That's like their little calm down area. If you're angry about it, yeah, now the crate's a little bit scary, but if you're just ah, neutral, no emotion whatsoever, put them in crate, they're gonna settle much quicker than if you're frustrated, and they're more likely to go into it next time as well. Okay, I'm gonna move on. That was a good one, actually. I like that. I like going over my three strike rule. Bethany definitely would have passed that one to me. And Dash Dash B says, your tips are really helpful. Awesome, which one is that, TikTok or? Instagram. Awesome, I appreciate that, guys, thank you. All right, Sunflower, how can I get my one-year-old Jack Russell to walk beside me instead of pulling on the leash? Ooh, one-year-old. Did it say one-year-old? Yeah, one-year Jack Russell. 
So let me just give you guys a little bit of background on Jack Russells. They are uh, what Bethany would call micers and ratters, which means they have a ton of drive. It literally means that on farms, if you ever watch videos, they're like used to like pulling mice out of the ground, throwing them to the farmer, and then moving on, picking up more. That means they have a ton of drive, they got a ton of hyper-focus, and they tend to be very overstimulated in city environments. So if you're urban, you might be a little bit more challenged on this. And if you're rural, then I, I'm not really sure where you live, but if I'm gonna give you an urban environment, because that's kind of where we do most of our work. Bethany is more about the rural stuff. So urban environment, that has a lot of stimulation. You could try doing a harness. I don't personally recommend. I personally recommend using some kind of training tool that gives you control over the head, whether it's a gentle leader, an easy walk, even like maybe a martingale or a slippery or something. Those two, I would always say use a trainer because you need to make sure that you're using them properly. We don't want that leash sitting low on the neck where the trachea is. We want always sitting high up on the neck, right where all the pressure points lining the jaw is. That's how you get focus of a head and that's how you get control over a dog that's hyper-focusing and wanting the pull. And everything that we do when we introduce these tools is we're trying to gain focus for it. So when I put on a little bit of pressure, my dog pulls, 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 takes a moment to stop and be like, what the heck is that? Looks back. I capitalize on that looking back. The minute they look back, good, come, treat, move the opposite way. I try to wear these dogs down. If I'm not experienced at doing the walk and I haven't worked with a trainer, you're probably not gonna have all the different like healing and popping and let's go techniques. So you gotta just gain focus. Teach your puppy that when they add pressure, we're gonna do something about it. They add pressure to the leash, we're gonna stop, do small pressure back into the side, and when they eventually look, good come treat opposite direction so you're just trying to gain focus instead of promoting the pulling if a dog pulls bethany's biggest saying is a dog pulls do something about it i know pretty basic right but mind blown do something about the pull move in the opposite direction grab the focus reward the focus okay we got a couple tiktok questions you want to hear Let's all go. right so they just adopted a German short-haired pointer puppy. High energy. Older dogs are not accepting of her. Any tips? <laughs> That's like when you have the 15-year-old teenager and you bring over your six-year-old niece, six-year-old or six-year-old uh, nephew. Nephew wants to play Nerf guns. 16-year-old teenager wants nothing to do with him. High energy little kid won't match with low energy teenager who's brooding and just wants to hang out in the room playing video games and listen to their slipknot that, that that was me if you guys can tell um so for puppies that translate to young dogs don't regulate their energy older dogs do older dogs don't want to play with younger dog energy unless they have similar energy themselves so if you want younger dog to play with the older dog you have to regulate the energy for them and even then they still may not want to play guys i mean you can't force an older dog to want to play with a younger dog my older seven-year-old dog looks at puppies disdainfully she hates them she can't stand them they don't regulate their energy and she wants to just lay around on the couch 24 7 maybe run on the field once and then she's crashed out for the rest of the day so find energy level of an older dog that matches yours and then make sure you break apart the play frequently. Normally for a younger dog playing with an older dog, if the energies match, I only give them five to seven minute training sessions. Where did I get seven minutes? I don't know, maybe five to 10, even number, sure. But anytime you wanna do that play session, you have to be the one that splits them up. I start seeing a give and take, I like that. That means puppy goes at older dog, puppy backs off, older dog goes at puppy. That's like the give and take, the back and forth. But when I start seeing older dog back up, puppy takes, back up puppy takes i say okay older dog's getting tired and eventually we'll start getting frustrated that's your cue to be like all right let's pop on a leash pick up puppy put him in the crate take off the leash give him 10 15 minutes to cool off give the older dog some time to grab some water and just have alone time and eventually older dog will build up energy maybe depending on the age and the temperament and younger dog will be able to play with the older dog but you have to regulate the energy puppies and older dogs don't do it themselves older dogs just tend to get pissed off and they try to bite the puppy on the ear like they would like the mother would do to the puppy puppies don't understand that they don't stop and then it could escalate i don't want to get into the escalation of because it's more about puppies but regulate yourself any other follow-ups on that one that was actually a really good one no follow-ups on that one but we have a different one it says how do i get my dog to stop protecting his foot protecting his foot oh like reactivity like if you pick up a paw 
and I'm just gonna go off a of guess, but like you pick up the paw, they try to like, you try to clip a nail or something, they bite at your hand. I'm, I'm gonna go off of that, because I think that's kind of what you're talking about. Even if it's not the clipping the nail, I actually recommend doing a groomer or a vet to have the nails clipped, unless you're gonna do a dremel, because you're more likely to hit the quick and make it bleed. And once you do that, you're like in the, in the dark zone. They'll never let you touch them ever again. But in the moment of you just picking up a paw, we do counter conditioning. That means that if my dog likes food and they kind of have to like food for the counter conditioning, I get them used to taking a handful of food. I've just got a handful of kibble or something that they enjoy and I let them eat the kibble out of my hand. And as they do, I pick up a paw, let it go, good. Let them keep eating. Pick up a paw, let it go, good. Your counter conditioning, the nipping at the hand for basically saying, when I pick up your paw, it's the greatest thing in the world because you get a handful of kibble out of my hand. And then after that, they get more used to it. I start picking up a paw or just touching it, good treat. Touch it, good treat. Pick it up, let it go, good treat. Pick it up, hold it, good treat. Am I on the wrong path? You're picking up your mic, so. We, we have a clarification point, Sparky. I love some clarification. We are guys. actually talking it. about his food, not his foot. <laughs> But that was a really good step-by-step -step tutorial. Counter conditioning, guys. Counter conditioning. It's a big problem great. we have too. It is true. It is true. So I'm gonna go. Out, I'm gonna continue the counter conditioning of the foot, and then I'm gonna move on to the food just because I'm I'm already in it. So finally, pick up that foot, hold it for a couple seconds, give the treat. Counter conditioning body parts is a big thing because I know that a lot of dogs will, if you brush them, they'll try to bite at the brush. You pick up a paw, they try to bite at your hand. It's an easy way of helping them understand that when you pick things up. They should want to lick at your hands or lick at or look for the food in your other hand. It's a good thing. Now let's come back to the food. Will you read me the question one more time, please? I got a short attention span, guys. So how that. do I get my dog to stop protecting his food? Oh, that's a big one. So if you guys, I see that you guys are on. So give me some clarification. Is it protecting the food from the other dogs or from you? And I'm gonna just let that stew for a second. I'm gonna start with protecting it from you, just because I think that's a big one. Uh, one, I'm gonna start feeding dogs in the crate. No, oh, anything? Uh, no, not yet. No, okay. Um, so normally I'd say if it's from a human. From everyone. Everyone, dogs, you, ooh, okay guys. Uh, so this is a little bit more behavioral. This is getting into the weeds of everything, but I'm gonna try to give you guys a quick breakdown. But again, this is like more adult dog behavior or more behavioral, not so much obedience. So whenever dogs are protecting their food from humans, dogs, whoever it is, a squirrel walking by, I don't know. Um, I start feeding dogs in their crate. I close them in the crate. I prep the food out of the room of the crate. I start creating disassociation to the food. Most time dogs that protect food tend to be really locked down, shaking, waiting for the food, pawing at us, barking at us, jumping on the counter to get to it. I break away from that in a strong way, meaning that when I start feeding dogs, they go in the crate, close it, lock it, walk away, prep food in the other room, wait a little bit of time. If I hear barking, frustration, demanding, I wait until that barking stops. I don't bring food in until it does stop. When I do finally feed, I kneel in front of the crate, I have a hand on the crate door, I open the crate door, slowly, dog tries to come out, close it, be firm, don't be afraid, you're not gonna hurt your dog just by closing the crate a little bit firmly. And when they finally back off and sit, or at least, take a breath and allow you to slowly put that bowl in and allow you to release it. Bowl, close door. I stop putting the pressure on them of eating out of the crate. When dogs eat out of the crate, sometimes if they come from a big litter or they come from and they're like the run to the litter, they've learned that they have to protect the food. So that just makes so you take some of that pressure off. Don't try to take the food out of their bowl. Don't try to take the bowl away from them. That's advanced stuff, guys. And that means that you've already got a dog that's built trust with you that you're gonna give that bull back or you're gonna give the food to them. Another solution a lot of people will do, and uh, I've seen quite a few trainers do this, I don't personally do this, I do the other way, but they'll take all of that food and it never goes in a bowl. It goes in a training bag and they reward the dog for every piece of kibble that they take, they make them work for it. And if you don't have a lot of time, maybe you can put it in a bag and you do like a handful of four or five pieces of kibble. Dog sit, good treat, give them the handful of kibble. They work for every single piece. And when eventually they get them back inside the crate, I told you I was going to go quick, but there's no quick in this brain. Put them back inside the crate, go to feeding them in the crate, and just kind of hang out next to the crate. Don't hover over the crate. Don't try to put your hand in the crate. I'm not trying to get anyone bit. 
So just respect their boundary and then help them understand that no one's gonna take that from them. No dogs are allowed to eat next to them. They have separation from you. And that's all I'm gonna go into that one, guys, because that one, I mean, I could talk with Bethany on that for two hours if I really needed to. And truly look for a trainer. That's not something that anyone should handle on their own. Look for a, for a professional that doesn't do obedience, they do behavioral. You are not in the world of basic obedience or advanced obedience. You're in behavioral work that takes a long time and a lot of different steps to work on. Okay, I'm gonna go back to some of our Instagram. We'll come back to that one too. Oh, I've gone through all my Instagram. What happened, guys? Three questions? What happened? Okay, all right, Ricky, give me more. What else do we have? We have another one. Do you love your dogs and your job? Do I love my dogs and my job? I really do. I uh, actually work 60 hours a week. I do this seven days a week. I enjoy the heck out of what I do because I uh, actually trained to be a doctor for seven years. I went to school for it. And five years into it, I was like, oh man, this may not be for me, but if I drop out, my dad is gonna kill me. He's put a lot of money into this. And on the seventh year, I took a leap year, did dog training full time. I was using it to pay for college or at least a portion of it. I said, this is, this is my thing. I'm good at it. I love working with people. I love working with dogs. I've got a couple dogs myself. So yes, to answer your question, I love what I do. It's been 13, or it's been 12 years in the mix and um, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Are, are we out of questions? Should I start reading Ready my Ready for list? my questions? I am. Do you want to read them off your list? Sure. All right. What is the first command someone should teach their new puppy? Oh, this is Bethany's favorite, guys. I hope she watches it and is sad she missed it. All right, relationship building exercise, and that comes in two parts. Part one is teaching a dog lure, which basically means that anytime I want my dog to follow food, I start teaching them how to follow the hand with the food. So I take a treat, I touch it to the nose, I kind of move it back and forth a little bit, get those eyes following the food, then good treat. And the name, have them follow the food, good treat. I get them watching the food and just wanting to follow it. And then from there, I start doing come practice. This is still more relationship building exercise. This is teaching name recognition, hearing their name, tuning into your voice, and then us saying come and slowly walking backwards. You gotta go with the pace of your dog, guys. If you got a, a fat bulldog that's only four months old and they're already 40 pounds, you gotta move slow. Really let them follow that hand and slow enough to where they follow it you give it to them halfway through. So dog come, good, as they make that decision to follow, and then at the end of your walk, give them a treat. Start with one step, go up to three, go up to five, try to cross the room. The more you do this, the more they want to follow you. Because everything that, everything that matters to a young puppy and an owner is building relationship. You wanna build a lasting bond, you want them to learn to love and to follow your body movements, your body language. That's the answer to that one. Awesome. So we get this question a lot. When can I start letting my puppy sleep in bed with me? Never. No, okay, 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 okay. Um, oh, this is a hard one. I'm trying not to be the stickler. I'm trying to be nice. Uh, Instagram questions we'll get to after. Okay. So it really depends on temperament and personality. I think that no dog in the beginning should sleep in a bed with people. I think that dogs need to learn how to be crate trained throughout the night. And I have a lot of reasons for this. In our current climate of COVID, I know we're getting low on time, so I'll try to go through this one quick. In our current climate of COVID, we spend a lot of freaking time with our dogs, a lot of time. And overnight is one of the easiest ways to separate from your puppy. Help them build confidence and independence. And how they do that is by sleeping on their own. If you have a dog sleeping in bed with you and you're running into issues like barking when you leave the house or pulling on the walks, I mean, that's not so much, but I'm going to put it in. I'm throwing it in there. Why not? Pulling on the walks, barking to demand your attention, crying to get their food, basically demanding behaviors or separation anxiety behaviors. The easiest way to break that or start breaking it is to crate train overnight, 100%, and then throughout the day as well. I'll admit, guys, I have, I have given many different stages to my dog's life. In the beginning, I crate trained for the first year and a half, two years. She didn't sleep in my bed. And my girlfriend at the time hated me. She thought we got the dog to sleep in the bed. She was wrong. We didn't. We got it because we love dogs. But dog slept in crate. After two years, we kind of branched out and we started allowing the dog to sleep on a dog bed at the end of the bed. Not on the bed, but on the floor at the end of the bed. So uh, their own space. Dog is three and a half, four years old. We allowed them to sleep on the bed, but we had the choice. The dog never just jumped on the bed. We had to invite them up, give them a spot, and they couldn't end up 
trying to lay on my shoulder. I have a 95 pound dog, guys, so gives an idea. No, no shoulder laying dogs, and our dog would want to lay on the shoulders if she could, but we gave spatial boundaries. We still gave them a spot on the bed that they had to stay. But if I have any dogs that have separation anxiety, demanding behaviors, frustration, pulling, anything like that, no, I'm really strict with the boundaries and I never allow them to sleep on the bed. So know your dog, know their personality. All right, uh, so we have two more questions on Instagram. The first one is, hi, my six month old dog marks every single bush, fire hydrant and corner. How do I help him understand that it's an unwanted behavior? Hold them accountable. That means leash. So if a dog gets to a bush, they're gonna pee on the bush. And if you gotta pee here, they're gonna find ways to do that. If you don't give them access to get to that bush, they could never do it. I'm not sure if you guys have big dog, small dog, it doesn't really matter to me. If they're on a harness, big dog or small dog, they're gonna find ways of getting there or you're gonna feel like you're getting your bicep workout over your entire 15, 20 minute walk. So you might need to get some control over the head, get some leverage. Remember guys, leverage is giving control to the uncontrollable. So that means training tool, gentle leader, easy walk, not unless you have a young developing puppy and hurt the joints and easy walk can, but maybe even like a martingale or a slip lead or if you guys hire a professional dog trainer that introduces it, but you need leverage, you need control over your puppy to prevent, prevent them from getting there. Because that's, that's not like a small puppy issue, that's an adolescent issue. It's them saying, this is mine, everything's mine. And I'm sure, I mean, it might even develop even them doing it inside the house or at friends or neighbors' houses. So you gotta get control over it. Prevent by redirecting away or preventing them from ever getting to the bush.